Hi everyone, my name is Julie McCreary and this video is part seven of the unit one series on biological basis of behavior. This particular video will focus on how researchers study the brain. As you can see, we are at 1.4, the topic is the brain. And you so far have watched two previous videos, part five and part six, which have covered the structures of the brain and the lobes and association areas of the cerebral cortex. So it's important that you've watched those videos prior to this particular video because those have laid the foundation about how the brain operates before we go into the techniques that examine the brain. So today's key focus questions are, how have case studies furthered our understanding about the structures and processes of the brain? And what tools can researchers use to learn more about the brain? These are the essential concepts that will be covered in today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them as they relate to studying and examining the brain. To start, I want you to notice the blue text box at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. This comes from the College Board for AP Psychology CED, which just outlines what students should know for the course. This objective is 1.4. A7, and it outlines the primary purpose of today's video, but you might notice it packs a lot of different topics into one sentence. I'll read it for you. Students should know that research on the brain is done using scans, and it lists two, EEG and fMRI, as well as case studies and surgical procedures, such as lesioning, to promote understanding of how the different structures of the brain work and how the brain functions together as a whole. So to start, I'll share some of the major case studies that have occurred throughout history that have revealed information about the brain and have taught us about how the brain functions. And then I'll get into some of those other topics later. So let's start with the first very classic case study about the brain, and it comes from 18. 48, and I mentioned it in the Unit Zero series on research methods, and it's about a man named Phineas Gage. Now, remember the context is in the 1800s, so this is before the brain imaging techniques we have today. So people didn't know quite as much about all of the different structures of the brain and how they uniquely functioned. So let's start with Phineas. Phineas was a railroad worker and he survived traumatic brain injury while he was working out on the railroad, accidentally a tamping iron, and you can see he's holding that iron rod, went through his frontal lobe. So it went through his cheek and out the top of his head and this damaged that front portion of his brain. Now, before the accident, people described Phineas as responsible, reliable, polite, and after his brain injury, his personality dramatically changed and he was reported to have become impulsive and rude. And this case study was pivotal in our understanding at the time of how the brain functioned in its role in our personality and our control of our behavioral impulses. Gage's injury demonstrated that there are specific regions of the brain that are involved in regulating our behavior and personality, and it provided early evidence for how the frontal lobe is essential in our executive functions like decision making and social conduct and emotional control. The next historic case study comes from a man named H.M. In 1953, H.M., or Henry Malazan, underwent brain surgery to treat severe epilepsy, and the surgery removed his hippocampus and surrounding areas, and you can see that in the diagram of his brain on the screen. This surgery left H.M. unable to form new long-term memories, which is a condition called anterograde amnesia, but despite this, he, he still was able to maintain his short-term memory and procedural memories. And procedural memories are memories for like motor skills, and these remained intact. So HM's case helped us better understand memory in the brain. It showed how crucial the hippocampus is for forming new long-term memories, but not necessarily for motor skills. And this separation of memory functions highlighted the brain's complexity and the specialization of the different brain regions. Another historic neuroscience case study that taught us about the brain is Clive Waring. And Clive Waring, like HM, helped us really better understand and target how the hippocampus works in the brain and its um, relation to memory. Clive is a British musician who suffers from one of the most severe cases of amnesia ever recorded, and it was a result of brain damage. He contracted a brain infection and he experienced damage to his hippocampus, as well as a few other brain areas that are critical for memory. This left Clive unable to form new memories like HM, which is anterograde amnesia, and with significant gaps in his past memories, which is called retrograde amnesia. Interestingly enough, though, HM not only lost most of his memory due to his damage to his hippocampus, but 
he still retained his memory for musical abilities, which as we learned is a procedural memory for those motor skills. And he can still play the piano and conduct choirs. Clive's case study reveals not only the importance of housing our long-term memories in the hippocampus, but it also helps us better understand that our procedural memories are housed elsewhere and that we know now after learning about the brain in our previous videos, that is housed in the cerebellum. The next historic brain-based case study is a report on Tan. Louis Victor LeBourne, who was called Tan by his hospital staff because this was the only word he could say, became a significant case study on understanding the brain. Tan started having epileptic seizures when he was young, and by the age of 30, he lost the ability to speak. He was admitted to the hospital where he communicated using gestures, and despite losing his ability to speak, he understood spoken language very well. Over time, his condition worsened and he became paralyzed on his right side. Dr. Paul Broca studied Tan, and after his death, Paul Broca found severe damage to a localized area of his frontal lobe, and you can see that pictured in the image A and the image B on the screen. Through this case study, Dr. Broca discovered damage in that very specific part of his left hemisphere that was causing him speech aphasia. We now call this area Broca's area, and damage to this region causes the inability to produce speech. So the next important case study is the case of Joe. However, before I continue into his situation, it's important that I define a few key terms. You might have noticed that in parentheses, it mentioned the word lesion as a reference to surgical procedures. And since Joe's case is an example of a surgical procedure that teaches us about how the brain operates, I'll define it here. So a lesion simply refers to tissue damage and it doesn't necessarily have to be damage to the brain. Um, lesions can happen anywhere on the body, it can also be be something that occurs naturally um, by disease or trauma in the cases of um, like Phineas Gage or HM or Clive Waring, but lesions can also be situations that are planned surgical procedures or experiments that are intended and um, purposely set out to destroy tissue on the brain, which happened here with the case of Joe. So lesions can teach us how the brain works because we can assume that any changes to the person's abilities or cognitive functions are tied to that tissue damage. So split brain procedures are planned surgical procedures that are intended to bring relief to an individual with severe epilepsy. However, there are also really great case studies for brain researchers to better understand how the brain hemispheres work. Split brain surgeries involve severing the corpus callosum, which as you remember is that fibrous structure that connects the left and right hemispheres. And by cutting the corpus callosum, the spread of epileptic seizures from one hemisphere to the other is prevented, which reduces the frequency and severity of the seizures. And if you watched video part five, you learned that the corpus callosum is responsible for allowing the communication to go back and forth between the left and right hemispheres. So in split brain patients, two hemispheres are not communicating directly with one another because they have had the corpus callosum severed. And this leads to really fascinating insights about how each side of the brain processes information independently from one another. So before I share about what happened to Joe and what we can learn from Joe's brain, let me first do a quick explanation about the visual pathways because that will help you better understand the effects when we look at what happens with a split brain patient. So I'll make this quick. You can see the diagram on the screen that there is a left visual field and a right visual field. And in the left visual field, there's a pencil. And in the right visual field, you can see there's an apple. And if you follow those visual fields, you can see that they're both going into each eye. And then if you follow it through the eyes, you're going to notice that the optic nerves take those images to the optic chiasm. And this is just a junction where the visual stimuli in the right visual field is now going to travel to the left visual cortex. So you can see the apple is traveling from the right visual field to the left visual cortex in the occipital lobe and the visual stimuli in the left visual field which is the pencil is then going to travel back to the right visual cortex in the occipital lobe so that pencil is going to go to the right side now because our hemispheres are connected by the corpus callosum they're going to be integrated into one seamless visual image together um, so that's the new information let me also remind you about some information you have already learned from previous videos you already 
already know that our brain is con is using contralateral control, which means the left hemisphere coordinates the movements of the right side of the body and the right hemisphere controls the movements of the left side of the body. And you also know that Broca's area and Wernicke's area reside only on the left hemisphere, meaning that the parts of our brain that control speech and language are only housed on the left side. So now let's see what happens to Joe who's had his corpus callosum severed. So let's go into what will happen when the corpus callosum is severed. And we are going to use the case of Joe. So in the photograph, you can see Joe is seated on the left. He's wearing a striped shirt and Michael Gazaniga is the researcher and he is seated on the right wearing glasses. Now, before I explain this particular test, I want for you to think about what you know. Think about the visual fields, think about where they go in the brain, think about where speech is housed. And remember, Joe is a patient who has had his corpus callosum severed everything else in his brain is left intact. So in this demonstration, Michael Gazaniga and Joe are looking at a desktop computer and Michael asks Joe to stare at the dot in the center of the screen. And the screen is displaying the word P-A-N and it's spelled out on the left hand side of the screen. You can see what the screen looks like here. It's a white computer screen with a dot in the center in the left visual field is the word pan. Then Michael Gazaniga asks Joe to verbally tell him what he sees. You know what Joe's response is? I don't know. It's odd, right? But remember what part of the brain is responsible for speech. And think about where the word P-A-N is going in his brain. And remember his corpus callosum has been severed. And so it's going to the right hemisphere and it's not able to cross the corpus callosum to go into the left speaking part of his brain. So then Michael asks Joe to close his eyes and let his hand draw what he sees. And he asks Joe to pick up the pencil with his left hand. So Joe closes his eyes and with his left hand, he starts to draw what he saw. Now remember, Joe's left hand is controlled by his right hemisphere, which is receiving the word pan. So his left hand is able to draw what he verbally said he had no idea what was on the screen. Fascinating, right? So this, these are things that you already know, but you just need to take note of. Um, this particular case study teaches us about hemispheric specialization and contralateral control, and it's on full display here. Because the hemispheres have unique functions, like speech on the left side, Joe cannot communicate with words what he's seen because his left hemisphere got the blank side of the screen and it wasn't able to receive the information with the corpus callosum from the right side. So he verbally said, Nothing. He didn't know because that is what his left side got. Since the word pan went to his right non-speaking hemisphere, his left hand could draw it because of contralateral control. So split brain research has taught neuroscientists a lot about the way the hemispheres operate, how each is specialized, and how the corpus callosum allows them to work seamlessly together. But when they're severed, um, it is entirely different. We have two independently operating hemispheres. So our final case study is about a girl named Maura Lieb. Now this teaches us about brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. And first, brain plasticity is just referring to the brain's ability to rewire itself or create new connections. And our brain as children is very plastic. Human brains have a greater ability to modify and rework their neural connections the younger they are. And we know this based on case studies, which have uh, younger patients and we can compare what happens to younger patients in similar situations that occur to older patients. And this is what is seen when there is damage experienced to the brain tissue. We can see how the brain reworks itself to recover some of those damaged functions. Now Maura Lieb is a great example of how the brain can do this and you can see her here in the photograph from this 2003 People magazine article. And due to severe epilepsy, Maura had the left hemisphere of her her brain removed. This is called a hemispherectomy. And she had this occur at nine months of age. So very, very, very young. Since this particular surgery led to paralysis on her right side and the loss of language, her parents committed her to intensive rehabilitation. Now through physical, occupational, and speech therapy, Maura began gradually regaining some of those lost functions. She sat up at 18 months. She walked at 23 months and she spoke sentences by the age of six and a half. 
And this is really remarkable and it intrigued scientists who study brain plasticity because we know that the left hemisphere is solely responsible for our speech and language abilities as well as the motor movements of our right side. So it's a fascinating case study on brain plasticity in which Mora's brain was able to slowly rework and rewire and regain some of those abilities on her right hemisphere. However, brain plasticity is limited. Mora's right hemisphere couldn't fully replicate all of the abilities of a complete brain, and she still faces ongoing challenges with speech and physical weakness. But this does teach us that younger children, the younger you are, the more promising um, it is that you may rework and rewire some of those lost connections. And this is called brain plasticity. Researchers have found that the older the patients are, the less plastic their brains are and the less likely they are to regain as many neural connections. So the next topic is brain imaging, and today researchers can learn about the brain through technologies that allow us to record visual activity in the brain as well as look at individual structures. And there are many different ways that researchers can do this, like CT scans, MRIs, PET scans, EEGs, fMRIs. The College Board is really only concerned with students being able to explain two of them, and that is EEG and fMRI. But I will briefly mention the others um, just so that you kind of have a, a general understanding of some of these other scans and technologies. So the one that you need to know, EEG, EEG is used to record brain activity and it's specifically electrical activity in the brain. And it produces a readout that shows waves. Researchers record these brain waves through a device that looks a little bit like a shower cap that's filled with electrodes and it's covered with conductive gel and it allows them to detect the elect electrical activity in the brain. As I mentioned, you really only need to be able to define and describe EEG and fMRI, but I may show you some images from other types of brain scans throughout the year, so I just want you to at least be familiar with them. So really briefly, a CT scan is also called a CAT scan, and it's good at showing hard tissues like bone, and it uses a series of x-ray images, and that kind of helps it create that image from different angles. An MRI uses a strong magnetic field, and it produces an image that allows you to see soft tissues. A PET scan is really helpful in locating areas of the brain that have activity where the EEG is just producing waves of the activity. The PET scan is using radioactive tracers that actually go to the area where there's brain activity. It actually goes to um, areas where glucose is being consumed. And this is where the neurons are most active. And so it's showing you where that activity is occurring with glowing regions. Now, I would say an fMRI is a good middle ground between the PET scan and the MRI. And it's kind of the best of both worlds because not only does it show the soft tissues where you can actually see the different structures of the brain like the MRI, but it also shows the activity like the PET scan. So the fMRI stands for functional MRI and researchers can use it as a technique to reveal blood flow, which ultimately is showing where the brain activity is. And then it shows you the MRI images of the tissues. So you can see an image of an fMRI brain scan here pictured on this slide. So this brings us to the end of the content. Let's finish with a few review questions. Remember, I'll read the question aloud to you and you'll need to pause to determine the answer. Question number one says, when Amita is in a car accident, her neurologist, Dr. Lang, suspects an injury to the back of her brain. Can you check the EEG? Asks Amita's brother. Dr. Lang explains that an EEG is not the best method for assessing this injury because... Question number two says, Zoe did a report on the brain's ability to change in response to both experience and damage. What was her report about? And question number three says, a patient who has undergone split brain surgery is shown a picture of a dog in his right visual field and a cat in his left visual field. In this example, which of the following will the patient be able to verbalize? This concludes part seven, techniques for studying the brain.